So let's start with the word of prayer today and we'll jump into it. So we do thank you, our God, that you are the creator of the universe and you give us the ability to reflect and engage and come to understand the nature of what you have made and do that to more understand yourself. We understand the confusion that often comes in that pursuit. And so we just pray for clarity in the works of T.F. Torrance and Steve as he guides us and um, delving into mysteries, but with the fruit that you would bring for us. So bless our conversation. May you be honored and all the glory go to you. And we pray this in your name, you whose Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And there's Bryden from Down Under. Good. Right. Well, today we have Steve Soleri. Somehow soul sounds like sun. Is does your name connect with the sun? It is, but in some way that I have not been able to crack. I've got a funny story about an Italian student who tried to explain it to me, and we had the most uh, confusing discussion. I uh, I went to a school with people from all around the world, and uh, even though it was in um, Little East Texas, but um, I, I spoke to a, a lady who was from Italy, and I said, you know, I always wanted to know what my name means, and I, I, I understand the parts of it, the roots of it, but I'm trying to figure out, like, does Solari mean, you know, like a, a skylight or something? And she said, yeah, that's a Solari. I said, okay, because I was thinking it could also be like a window or something. Yeah, that's a Solari. And I, okay, okay, well, but what about like an attic or something? I, yeah, that's a Solari. And so I figured it's just kind of like Smurf. I don't know if you remember that commercial, but that one word just referred to like all nouns in the dictionary. So I gave up trying to figure it out. I just figure it's related to the sun in some way. You're every man, every time. <laughs> we'll go for the skylight part there, that there's lights that will come in because you are there and it's something beyond you and yet uh, made visible and makes other things more visible because of the, <laughs> the not getting in the wayness of a skylight, right? It doesn't get in the way. It allows things to come through. So, so right. that's a beautiful picture. So, right. Steve, if you could just start by telling us, uh, you know, what you're doing and uh, a little bit of the background with Carrie Magruder in what has prepared you for this book that uh, makes you excited about working with us today. Yeah. So uh, I am still a pastor in uh, North Dallas and uh, just finished, I don't remember how long ago it was, but uh, about a year or so ago, uh, finished my master's in pastoral uh, studies and um, still have a wide range of, of interests Part of the reason Carrie and I have a continued friendship is we have a shared interest in both um, science and um, faith. And um, I actually almost, to, to illustrate that point, I, I, I had a toss up of where I would go to undergraduate school. Uh, it was either going to be Rensselaer Polytechnic up in Troy, New York, which had a, a great reputation. It was on the East Coast, it was second to MIT, as I understand. Uh, so it was either going to be that or Bible College in East Texas. And so I kept going back and forth and ended up going to Bible College. Um, but I still just have this voracious appetite for, ap let's say appetite, appetite not aptitude, <laughs> um, for, for science. My YouTube feed is full of all kinds of science updates, and uh, I just I love it. And uh, so I, I continue to love merging the two concepts together. Um, I, I've never seen really science and faith as in opposition to each other, which is part of what Kerry teaches in his course, that the idea that the two are in this um, uh, mutual animosity, this kind of a negative dialectic is really a myth. And uh, I appreciate that. And it, it actually kind of I lament the fact that so many people see it that way, that, you know, if you encounter a Christian who believes that myth and they think, you know, well, science will never understand the truth of God and they can't and they're a bunch of fools. Well, you, you've bought into one of you, you've fallen into one of the ditches and likewise the other way. And uh, there are so many people who are um, believers and um, fans and practitioners of science. So between the two, um, this kind of material from Torrance is really valuable, especially how he invites us to put aside our different, let's say, preconceived notions and dive into the history of it to say, okay, here's where some of those things are coming from. And here's why we went astray so many years ago. And there is a lot of history in this chapter, which is, mm -hmm. it's yeah. insightful to figure out how we got so far astray. 
in the conversation and also ways to come back. I mean, that's the hopeful piece of that. Yeah. So last month, Ted and uh, Tom Noble took us through the kind of the division, the dualisms that uh, arose. And so in this chapter, um, just give us a, a you know, brief statement. What is it that is the overarching vision of what TF wants you to get out of creation and science in chapter three? Yeah. Um, man, it's hard to put it into a simple statement, but yeah. I would say that um, it kind of comes back to one of, uh, I would say, a favorite phrase of Torrance, this idea of divine and contingent order and this con concept of how um, things are not mechanistic or fatalistic or random, but rather it it relates back to a creator in the sense that things are both dependent on him and interdependent and that um, things are not the way they are simply because they had to be but rather because they were designed that way and uh, but he he does so not by just uh, laying it out there as something to be accepted but rather than kind of a worldview that you need to take and how some people have arrived at those lenses on either side of the equation let's say um through some of those mistakes over the years and they think that well this is true because of this worldview not even realizing that you know it's the old cliche about you know fish talking about what's water you know you don't realize the belief system you're within until you're you know someone actually makes it clear to you good good so it's a chapter of contrasts and ways to achieve at helpful ways to engage science in the end yeah. And to recognize some of the wrong steps that have been taken in the history of science yeah. and how we can understand why they got where they did, but that they're not the ways forward, really. Definitely. Definitely. Right. So on your handout, you begin with introductory remarks. First point, lenses, biases, paradigms, and hermeneutics. Do you want to say anything about those to just kick us off a little bit here? Yeah. Um, so to me, what uh, I, I think is really important is this idea of um, if you look into critical thinking skills in general, or if you look into epistemology, which is just a, a you know, a, a simple way of saying, how do we know what we know? Um, he's delving into these systems of thought and ways of thinking um, that are they have certain fundamental assumptions or they come from a certain way of viewing the universe and that those can be kind of problematic. Um, so I, I know that, that it could be a little bit dangerous, but I'm hoping to handle the topic carefully. But I just want to reference the pandemic as, as we all experienced it as yeah. a time when most of us, I think, started to wonder, no matter what our opinions were on the, the constituent issues, we started to wonder, how do I know what I know? And what sources of information can I trust? And within that, we became very emotionally attached to whatever it is that we kind of wanted our, to plant our flag on. And what typically happened as well was that we developed this kind of a almost a hometown football team kind of rabid, my team is correct and yours is wrong. And to the point where I think most of us started to look at our friends and family and, and other community members and say, um, how on earth are you arriving at that conclusion? Because I'm arriving at something completely different. And sometimes it was different sources of information, but often it was worldview. Often it was the way we see society, we see government structures, uh, healthcare, whatever the topic might be. And not until you start to evaluate some of those systems of knowledge and some of those sources, not until you really kind of dig into some epistemology, does it make sense to you to say, oh, now I see why you see things that way and why I see things this other way. And even if you can't come to agreement, at least you can come to understanding. And that's so pivotal in the sense of reconciliation between human beings, which goes back to relationship, which is what Torrance and Bart you know, would argue is, is I would say, the, the fundamental of, of our faith. So that's why I wanted to put lenses, bias, paradigms, and hermeneutics. And those are so 
at the heart of this chapter and arguably the whole book, because if we're talking about the ground and grammar, that's saying, what are the tools with which we will um, describe our ideas? What is the language? And often when I'm doing Bible studies or uh, facilitating any kind of prayer group or discussion, when debate comes out, I'll often say, I think that we're, we're getting betrayed by our own language um, because of the limits therein. And sometimes people will be saying the same thing, but using different words or using the same words and meaning very different things. Um, you know, often we talk about how the Greeks had multiple words for love and how in English you basically have one. It's the same kind of idea, but we tend to do the same thing. Um, and I can't tell you how many times people proof text around me as if it is evidence for whatever particular school of thought they believe when they really just pulled it out of that one space and then they use it as some kind of a universal truth in its own. So yeah. I see um, Torrance kind of making an argument, you know, that that this is where some of our thinking is coming from. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of critical pieces there. One is um, what you might call the quest for truth. You know, everyone trying to figure out what is the truth about what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And Alan Torrance once talked about capital T truth and small t truth. We don't have access other than in the person of Jesus to capital mm -hmm. T truth. So we have truths, which your word lenses, biases, paradigms, and hermeneutics mm -hmm. are the little t truths that we hope have reference to the big t truth. And this chapter is really talking about how do we become clear about our reflective little t truths so that they're oriented to the big t truth, particularly the person of Christ, but also the world created by God, hence the word creation, the nature of reality, and how we align with regards to that. So that's Still a huge, a huge issue today, isn't it? I mean, watch the news any day of the week, any time of the day, mm -hmm. and you'll find yourself asking, there's so many different opinions there. How do we get to something that is, you know, a grounded reality? So this yeah. is not something that Torrance just wrestled with long ago. It is something we mm -hmm. wrestle with today. And the second, the word science is one of those words that that can mean many different things to different people. Right. Right. And so Torrance <laughs> is really um trying to orient science and if we if we say science is always in the sense of the big t little t science is always the little s that corresponds to the little t sure it's our it's our reflection on the world um when we talk about creation then um, creation and nature as we go through the chapter is going to move in terms of what that means mm -hmm. the nature of the relation to that moves and and hence the dialogue of this chapter mm -hmm. is just the complexity of in a sense a moving target or a moving set of lenses and presuppositions so that's yeah, what makes it both interesting and challenging yeah and i can appreciate the kind of scholarship that torrance brings to it in terms of connecting the dots as to how our understanding of the world around us the created order uh, has evolved over time and how some of our ideas have evolved not necessarily because of a particularly strong rational development but just because of the societal influence or because of particular uh, things that happened to occur at a certain time that kind of swayed the general thinking about a particular issue again not because it was the correct idea but just because it was something that um kind of dependent on it, its times um yeah. I did want to ask, maybe it would give us a little bit better context uh, since it comes up a few times. Um, it might be helpful to kind of just recap quickly the discussion of dualism that, that took place last week, yeah. um, because that will shine some light on our, our time today. What, um, what, what maybe the Reader's Digest version of yes, last week's discussion? Yeah. <laughs> Where, Where are, are you, Ted? Ted, <laughs> do you want to recap? The session you did with Tom Noble. Well, was that last week? That was like a month it was, ago. It was a month ago. It was, it was well, a month ago. ago. <laughs> we were say, reading this book have once we a not, month. Have we not met between those? Uh, but that was we last haven't time met, but we haven't met on yeah. this subject. So he's referring yeah. to the coverage of Chapter 2 with the incredible Ted Johnston and the incredible Tom Noble. Ted and well, Tom. Tom Noble should be here to speak for himself, but... Uh, yeah, the, the issue of dualism obviously is huge for Torrance, and and indeed in the current chapter, he he mentions it quite a bit. Um, 
and that idea. And so that, that chapter goes through a number of different dualisms and just kind of unpacks that. And I won't take try to try to remember each one of those like look looking back at the uh, mm -hmm. at the chapter. A simple uh -huh. statement would say if you go with if you go with Plato, it's the world of ideas separated from the real world. If you go with Aristotle, it's a focus on the quote unquote natural or given world and the history of humanity tends to take one or the other as a starting point the world of ideas that which is in the world of thought or that which is in the world of quote unquote the concrete and when applied christologically the idea of the jesus who is out there somewhere gnostic or deistic there's a number of terms that he deals with in that chapter are ways that detach jesus from the world so in a world of kind of ideas and the um, Apollinarian, the view that he he was fully human. Um, Arius is the classic one, and the Arius Athanasius, who saw Jesus as a high human, but he really collapses Jesus into a, this world way of being. So the dualism is always between the world of the seen, the experienced, and the world of thought. Sometimes what is called the spiritual world would be that metaphysics generally is that which is beyond. So those there's thousands of ways that people, I think, express those divisions. Right. And, and I, we certainly talked a lot about the severing of the connection between science and faith, which uh, we've already referred to in this session uh, as yes. the result of that dualistic thinking, which has had tremendous impacts, uh, which brings us to the current chapter, I guess, in that respect. Exactly. Science is this world, faith is the other world. I mean, it's that's yeah. a shorthand. Yeah, the of twain shall meet, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And Bryden has his hand up there. Bryden, what do you want to say? Uh, in terms of emerging from that cultural shift, you know, the, the, the dualistic shift stuff, science deals with facts, by the way, observable facts. We know this. Well, do we? <laughs> because oh, the facts never actually speak for themselves they speak out of a theoretical hypothetical framework and that's the bit that most common people dare i say that the man in the street fails to understand mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a theoretical framework behind and within and buried through every fact what am i saying the like split the between the phenomenal, the phenomena that we bump into, and the noumenal that Kant said we can't know, is exactly what Torrance is saying. Forget it. We penetrate. That, that's one of Torrance's lovely words. We mm -hmm. penetrate by constructing more and more refined formulations of the question mm -hmm. into the deep things that organize. And thank you. Thank you, Steve for your business about divine and contingent order. Because as we penetrate into these things more deeply, we see the order. We see the arrangement. We see the theoretical construct that actually is not a theoretical construct. It's your lovely word, a design. Right. It's a design. And I think that is what chapter two and chapter three tie together very nicely with Torrance. And um, the way he builds, I think we've said this before, Marty, with his work, why do the chapters flow in the order they do? Mm -hmm. These are not, you know, in these are not random things. I love it. So that that's enough. Thank you. Thank Good. you. Thank you, Brad. That's helpful. And I'm, I'm glad we're talking about the different the different approaches i'm thrown back on the idea of uh that's a salati because you know we, once again we have a term that can mean so many different things or smurf again because when i think of dualism i tend to go back to the classic misunderstanding of flesh bad spirit good and you know that th which is a, a, a maybe part of what we discussed in that list already but to me that that tends to be what comes to mind first and so i guess we could almost argue that there are many different as ted said there's a bunch of different kinds uh, but then it almost becomes unfortunate that we have the term at all because if it can mean so many different things you need to put some kind of a suffix on there and apply what kind of dualism are we talking about but to your point you know it, it's a matter of well in 
this case, we're talking about kind of the uh, the positivism of what can we detect, you know, with our um, with our senses versus um, what is it that we can know based on revelation and Jesus as the self revelator. Um, so maybe and we Jones should uh, put up a quote there from hmm. page forty five. We know the intrinsic structures of the universe in such a way that its basic design becomes disclosed. Right. So that's that is this whole we're talking about the nature of the givenness that it's disclosed, and therefore the work of proper science yeah. is to um, give a voice to, as Torres talks about us being priests of creation. We give voice to what creation itself has no voice. So the um, the question of the other forms of science that don't give voice to creation that only you know say what use is it to us. Um, there is no consideration of the nature of science. It becomes purely a human-centered resource for us to use that has no regard, dignity for God or creation other than as a resource. Which, you know, really, that's probably a good point for us to just look at this first paragraph here. I'll put it up on the screen um, because he kind of talks about that very point. He says, in my last lecture, I spoke of the fact that many of our contemporaries are afraid of relating theology and science. And I suggested that what lies behind that fear is a false view of science. Now, there's another issue of defining our terms yes. um, as well as a <laughs> false view of theology. If science is equated merely with instrumentalist science or technology, how do we master and manipulate nature for our own ends? Then how can that way of thinking be applied to God? And that's a good question. But how can you base theology on science? That's a question people keep asking me, and it's a good question, especially if science is of the instrumentalist or technological sort. In the last lecture, I tried to show that the whole picture has altered for a new world has opened up involving basic changes in science and even determinism has been disposed of or at least relativized for it holds good only at a comparatively low level of reality and then only within certain severe limits. Today, I want to show that far from theology being based on natural science, the opposite, if anything, is nearer the truth. So I especially <laughs> thought that last sentence would be interesting to kind of take apart together when he says, I want to show that far from theology being based on natural science, which I, I'm not quite sure why he thought that might be argued. I feel like more often, at least today, and perhaps I'm misunderstanding his point here, but when he says it, the opposite is nearer the truth. So does anyone kind of want to unpack that a little bit? I think the idea of theology based on natural science is just natural theology, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the, that's ar arguments from design that want to say, well, there's design, therefore there must be a designer. And yeah. so the Paley, Paley's argument of it, that's, yeah. that's doing theology by bringing a rational, rationalist definition to nature, searching through the world and finding examples in nature of design and then arguing from design to a designer. Uh, and, and unfortunately the word design then becomes taken prisoner, held hostage by a certain segment of the uh, devout public uh, and everything. If it doesn't reflect that design, then you begin to ban books that argue against it and that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I went to a seminary that was presided over by Charles Hodge and he, he found Darwin to be an atheist because he kept argue, Darwin kept arguing against design in nature. And not because design wasn't in nature, but he refused to use it as an argument to talk about the Christian God. Uh, we've got these ruts in our brains where yeah. the arguments have been going <laughs> for, for decades, in some cases, even centuries. This is what he was talking about, this this how the cultural dualism of Western civilization, even as it uh, allowed technology and science to flourish, uh, the people practicing that science found themselves repeatedly up against blockades, uh, uh, intellectual dead ends. They were not able to think outside the boxes that the culture had already given them. They had to, to 
move on and move through uh and his whole this chapter the second chapter was to sh to show that science itself even by its own boundaries and definitions was being blocked and impeded by a cultural dualism that it, uh, eventually that it had to think itself around uh with no help from the church mm -hmm. uh and then it was just tom's suggestion that the same dualisms are also saturating our our thought as especially for american protestants and we need to think around them uh with with the help of the holy spirit and occasionally just casting an eye over into the scientific community and seeing how they did it uh the, the whole idea that determinism is now considered a, a, a falsehood uh, in most areas of physics is a real neat thing unless you're a, a, a calvinist uh, who's still trying to work out predestination in deterministic categories? You're 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 just going to drive yourself nuts. How how is he <laughs> using the word determinism in this sentence? Because you know what did he mean in its intention of that which is dismissed, and then to what degree and how has it been relativized? I'm not sure that I fully grasp that. Uh, if I may, yes. Uh, determinism would, would be to say if you repeat the same experiment the same way you'll get the same results every time every time all the time from now until eternity because it is determined it is necessary it must work out that way okay since einstein and uh, well uh, since modern physics when when uh isaac newton's categories had to be uh highly qualified to say Yes, gravity works this way unless you're near a very large black hole. Then it's going to work different. Uh, or unless you're down in the physics of, uh, of, of subatomic particles, then it's going to work different. The, the con condition of where you observe begins to, to shape whether or not something is determined to go this way or that way, and you may not get the same results twice. Now, is your science no good? Or is your understanding of determinism no good. And they say, well, most physicists apparently now have to say, well, we're going to talk about determinism, relatively speaking. And that's not nonsense. Yeah. That, that that gives relativism a, a useful use in some scientific circles. And I, I hope, yeah. and, and, yes, thank you. And 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 you remember last time I, I posted that book, um, you know, 12 experiments that changed our view of the world. Uh, the Matter of Everything by that lovely Melbourne and Oxford scientist, Susie Shear. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll post it again, uh, uh, yeah, Steve, for, for your it, benefit. So. Um, also, I think what Tom is saying in that sentence is that famous quote of Bultmann's, I can't believe in miracles if I also believe in electricity. Mm. You know, in other words, the schism between the symbolic and the resurrection is, well, what is the resurrection? Because here's the concrete fact, this fellow was killed, dead and buried, end of discussion. That's the physical, that's the electrical. But as for miracles, well, what are they? Well, I don't know what they are, says Bultmann. So we have to demythologize that stuff. And I think when science buys into that, well, paradigm, if I can use your language, Steve, you've got a whole section of 20th century theology or even 19th century theology that kind of writes it off and and it literally writes it off and when you read as we did some time ago as a group space time and resurrection tom will go out of his way to talk about the significance of resurrection and ascension in the reordering of the space time world a little bit now and certainly in the future I mean, hallelujah to that stuff. Yeah. So that's enough. I love that quote from Bultmann. I think it's 1924. Yeah. I can't believe in both electricity and miracles. Well, right. I've said from the pulpit, why the heck not? <laughs> I mean, you know, I simply say, well, why the heck not? What's your problem? <laughs> right. uh, and so just to yeah, clarify, so determinism doesn't have any sense of who may have determined it. It simply says there is a continuity of reality it's just always going to be the same, and that's it. So it could have a deistic form that says there's a God who started it all to be determined. That's kind of your right. Calvinistic footnote. Right. But 
but that the nature of reality, we just need to see it as determined, constant, and science works because it's constant. But Einstein said, oh, no, it's not. I got the impression when I was looking up the word as well that, ironically, determinism almost um, engulfs the, the concept of randomness in that it says determinism... I'm sorry, let me restate. Determinism seems to be saying that this happened because it's the only way it could have happened. And so it's random in the sense that the laws as they are just happen to always bring about this result. And I thought that was an interesting kind of a, a shade to it. Yeah, that is interesting. So, um, I, 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 and, and sorry, uh, but thank you, Ken. Yes, you have to insist that there are other macro things and other micro things that will throw determinism, you know, into the trash can because the results the are going to be very different. Yeah. They're, in, in, in fact, they're going to be, quote, unquote, unpredictable, mm -hmm. random, to use that word, Steve, again. Mm -hmm. And I think that quantum physics now and particle physics now is ruling the roost. It, it's, it's terrific. Because we're going, oh, let's develop a bit of humility now. I mean, sorry, that's my take-home line. Yeah. That's part we of the don't know. principle and all that, that the nature of the observer will actually change that which is being observed and all that. Yeah. Well, well the, see, I think that's true too. But it's the actual brute fact of a black yeah. hole or the brute fact of subatomic particles yeah. doing it's things humility. that we just don't know about. And can't. Two-year-old children also. If you're observing them, they'll be very different if you turn your back. <laughs> you know, there's something... Oh, I love it. There's something in here that, that strikes me. I, I've always wanted to approach things carefully so that I wouldn't violate the rules of the game. And I feel like in some ways we can be intellectually dishonest without meaning to. And so there are certain ways that we can say, okay science is not being logical because they're not looking at this in this direction. And that may be correct. But I also think that many of us as Christians who aren't necessarily trained in hard sciences sometimes overgeneralize, oversimplify, and perform this deductive approach or reduc reductionist approach where we just make everything what we think it ought to be. So, and I'm not saying that's what you're doing. I'm just talking about that sometimes in our, our almost in our woundedness in this perceived war between science and faith, we want to kind of take out our sword and cut off the, other, the the soldier's ear, so to speak. And so it kind of becomes a matter of, you know, well, you should see that by your own understanding of relativity, that everything's relative and you, and nothing is, you know, necessarily Newtonian anymore. And that's, a, you know, and, and again, I'm not saying that's what you said, but it's just kind of a, that is a reductionist oversimplification. And I've heard people make that kind of argument. It's like, well, once Einstein came along, you know, Newtonian, and physics is gone and you know everything is relative no 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 you know that that that's that's the myth part of this and if we start picking up those tools to do warfare the conversation's over because we've already started to contradict our own ideas and we're not playing with the same terms and we're not being intellectually honest so that's just one of my things about this particular kind of debate and that's why sometimes when i'm reading torrance and i see him using words like relativism or relativistic i'm thinking oh please be careful there because the, it's so easy to overgeneralize that term so that it means almost anything that you want and we always need to be careful to define them for the context to make sure that they're fitting in what's going on and sometimes to say uh, torrance doesn't believe in dualism but he does believe in duality mm -hmm. there is male and female there is good and bad um, but we have to recognize that they are part of the relativity of one to the other and that part of what God creates in the universe is unities where there is distinctiveness or even beyond that particularity. There is the general, the universe, but there is you as a particular person. And so we need to recognize all those dimensions. That's part of the stratification of knowledge. Yeah, yeah it was it was uh, uh, God's absoluteness uh, tied to Newton's uh, 
banishment of relativity that mm -hmm. that blocked both science and religion in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, and science had to move out and move beyond because reality, creation was telling it to, mm -hmm. and obediently it followed. Mm -hmm. uh, and since then, I've, I've found many times, especially in uh, dealing with Tor Torrance or Bach or other theologians, relativity is a liberating concept because it breaks down these false absolutes and brings them into relationships so that they can then join in, in a hierarchy of, of value that is open-ended at the top. Uh, and so change and spontaneity and creativity is all not only possible, but it's it's sort of almost built into the system. It, what a great way to live. Uh, they, instead of having a fixed, closed universe, it is now open. As at the end of this chapter, uh, Tom points out uh, that it, that was his uh, great discovery that, that science properly understood was not the least bit threatening and very grateful for the help theology was able to offer. The second chapter, it just said, if, if we had this all worked out in the fourth century, why did Galileo have to recant? Why yeah, right. did I still try to ban Darwin from the schools? Why? There's all these, uh, that was his, uh, I pointed it out last time, that was a, a tough thesis uh, to argue in only one chapter. Uh, there are plenty of peop other people out there, and I, I have a whole shelf of books on uh, science and religion in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, 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 the fact that God blesses relativity to create room for humanity to be human is a great thing for me. Uh, the, the, as long as Jesus is the absolute, the true God, and the true man. Uh, mm -hmm. That makes everything else relevant. Yeah. And their relatives always show up, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They eat too much. <laughs> Building on <laughs> Brian's comments on facts, uh, Parker Palmer is about to know as we are known, says, the word fact, we have made this certain absolute, where the word fact really means human made, as in artifact, manufacture. It is a something human made. And so to say humbly, science is the human made reflection on the nature of reality that in Torrance's eyes keeps on growing and learning and discovering because it is a heuristic discovery process. But it is human, Michael yeah. Blagny's personal knowledge. Um, and so we, if we can humbly always say it's it's the best that we can know at this point, but let's keep learning together and recognize the different perspectives, which I'm gonna take you to the top of page 45 of that, which goes on to your second point. Um, when we have the different perspectives, sometimes we learn things even from people we disagree with by just clarifying what it is that we mean. So he's used these two German words, which I don't speak German, so Weltbild and Weltschensong. Um He Anschauung. gives those as, was that? Anschauung, Welt Anschauung. Yeah, what he said, what you said. So <laughs> he's giving these as a clarifying distinctive, and I'm not sure I understand the difference between the two of them to really understand the point that help us to go forward. But it's tied to worldview and misunderstanding. So anyone on that? Well, when I looked it up, and I'm not pretending to be an expert on German, um, but the, the distinctive that I noticed was that a, a, a Weltbild uh, was a theoretical understanding um, of the world and how it operates, and it seems to me in a more general sense, whereas uh, a Weltanschung um, is more about a particular philosophy or the worldview of a particular individual or group and tends to be kind of a, a I would almost think, a, a bit of a, a lens. Uh, in a sense, but if I have that incorrect, someone feel free to. It's it's so the, one is uh, as it is, the other is as it's viewed. Is that a, is that kind no, of the short? No. Yeah. The, the accusation that if if it, that's your Welt on Schaum, that you see it that way because that's you, hmm. uh, which like, like that's is your always choice. vulnerable to the Kantian thing that nobody can really know what it is in itself. You can only know what it looks like to you. And my, my looks like is different than your looks like, and we're just going to have to live with that. Mm -hmm. uh, the built says, no, there's more. There's something deeper behind all of these appearances. Let's keep asking questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and what is, what is and, the word German translated? Um, 
Um, Ken, am I right by saying that built is also a cognate of the word picture? It is. And the word picture is a much bigger, more holistic uh, aspect on things. Yeah. And therefore, just because you've picked up your palette and you've gone for yellow and red, doesn't mean to say that my palette doesn't have green and blue. No. Um, so I'm, I'm deliberately punning now with the word built picture yeah. and, and, yeah, and painted pictures. Tom liked to talk about uh, jigsaw puzzles. He said, when you're working down here in the corner with the green pieces, uh, you're, you're fitting the pieces together because like goes with like. And you're up here in the sky, you're working with blue pieces. Like is going with like. Nobody up there in the blue is saying that the only color allowed in this entire picture is going to be blue. Uh, or the only rational way of approaching life is to be green. Uh, it's built in that it's going to be, as you work, relativized by the whole, which is not yet fully in view. Okay. Uh, so maybe <laughs> you said, uh, Marty, that's your humility right there. Yeah. Well, that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and, and I'm fond of saying that in scripture, we're given the pieces of the jigsaw, but it's Jesus who gives us the picture on the lid. Yeah, that's the build. And, and you know, that's the build. Thank you. Yeah, naturally. End yeah, of good. discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that the other thing I would just throw in here is that I've become more convinced that when Robert stands against natural theology, and I'll be curious to see later in this book what Torrance does with it, but Natural theology is basically a prejudicial, a prejudged view of the world based on my reading, or however you say it. It's my framework, my reading, my lens that I'm trying to put onto God and the world. And he's and Bart is saying, no, there's only the one who gives us the big picture, who can appropriately found our knowledge or give us the ground of the knowledge that we might have. So Natural theology is really a stand against prejudice more than anything else. And the same would be true of the holy otherness of God is don't think that the words that you use from your worldview are going to be adequate because God is significantly enough different that you're just going to be led astray. So to just recognize the, the parallel between the dangers that Bart is pointing out and he's not just being abstract. Or trying to make it so that God becomes so metaphysical that he's of no earthly use. He's just trying to get really clear in the way that I think the sentence of, of Clarence's is trying to direct us to. We have to get the right picture in the right place with humility and go on listening. You know, like this discussion of the the different perspectives again and the different ways we we may perceive things um it kind of comes back to what i think of in terms of objective and subjective and how even those can have reductionist um definitions and one of the things that uh carrie and i were talking about before is that Many of us, especially if we're doing undergraduate work, we don't quite have a fully formed idea of what objective means. We tend to think of it in terms of uh, being devoid of any kind of opinion or um, or let's say logical framework. But he was saying that there's a good argument to be made that objective means you're using the right tools for the job, which relates back to cataphysin or cataphysin, depending on how you pronounce it, that you approach something as it self reveals. And I think that's a big part of this too, is that that to me, that kind of relates back to that built, you know, like that there is a truth, there is the picture or there is the, the truth that's there. And then it becomes a matter of, how do we perceive the information that it's sending us? What does my particular painting or my capture of it look like? And um, if I might just continue on that idea for a second, um, I recently saw an interesting video about how um, about how animals perceive the world compared to how humans could perceive the world. And there's a discussion that it's possible between our neurological uh, speed and our vision that we almost have an inherent frame rate, almost like a movie. And that, you know, we may have like about uh, approximately 55, 60 hertz, whereas some animals might have 30 or 40 hertz, and then some might be 70, 80, some birds, I think, go up to 200 hertz. And he even simulated what 
some of the world might look like uh, through those different eyes and ears. And it was really amazing because it then underscores our perception of reality is just that. It is not reality itself. It's always filtered through our senses and then filtered through our, our, our mental constructs as well. So to me, it's all really interesting. It still doesn't make me want to just give up and say, well, who can know anything? You know, I mean, the, the, there's no point in that. But the idea of saying that there are different approaches to reality, that I think is really helpful. Yeah. The uh, the distinction between what is the what is the center of the observable universe, mm -hmm. and what is the center of the observable universe, <laughs> yeah. um, and what is the center of the universe, what is the center of the observable universe, and what is the center of the universe, yeah. and there's a there's a hidden punchline in there you probably get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The observer is the center of the observable universe. Right. And everything you just said lives lives within that. It makes sense to me from where I stand. Right. That's where the worldview, the word worldview, each of us see from our worldview and therefore interpret from those lenses, worldviews, and often can't hear or understand somebody else who sees different things. Mm -hmm. right? Who was it? Who was it who said um we dance in a circle and suppose, well, the truth lies in the center and knows. I don't remember. I, I, I don't know either, but it's oh. somebody will come up with the, with that for us, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> say, hey, say it one more time, just so we have a good it, record of it. Something along the lines of we dance in a circle and suppose, but the answer lies in the center and knows or the truth is at the center and knows um okay anyway good well we'll we'll see if we can find who it is that said that in the context yeah. and the worldview of that person <laughs> so um let's see oh one of the things that i wanted to mention to um and again, I hope this doesn't run afoul of anyone's sensibilities of a discussion group, because in my opinion, the value of a discussion group does not lie in going all the way through the text, but rather having a, a robust interaction based on the text. And I, I feel the same way with Bible studies or anything. I don't care if we get through the chapter, the value is in the discussion itself. And we're, um, getting, we're getting the framework of the text. I mean, I think somebody yeah. hearing this would be able to understand it better, even if we didn't get through everything. So you're doing fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to mention was that um, recently I was asked to facilitate a Bible study at another um, congregation. And, um, oh, Robert Frost. That's great. Thanks, Ted. There you go. <clears throat> um, Uh, now that I'm facilitating this group, um, there, there are people that I haven't worked with for years and years, and so they have a different worldview. Um, most of them are coming from a different uh, denominational background, and it's been interesting because I'm trying to – my approach to preaching and uh, teaching what I'll call faith and spirituality is uh, the contemplative approach and the contemplative relational and with the framework of Trinitarian theology. And so I get the joy of, of talking with people and trying to deconstruct the, um, the antagonistic um, a Greek god, if you will, of um, – um, shall we say, um, my, mm, I was going to say, um, not universalism, but kind of a, um, the, the idea of a God who's not relational, kind of what Torrance is talking about with the unmoved mover, yeah. uh, only just slightly more than that. And as we unpack some of these ideas, and as I try to go down this road of saying, the God that we worship is highly relational and individually and personally so, such that he cares what we think and wants to be involved in even the most mundane things of our lives if we are willing to participate with him in that way. Um, it's interesting to see the light bulbs go off over people's heads or go on, I should say. And um, to see that kind of transformation is fantastic. But there are occasions when there are certain folks who feel like they know what they know. And if you start to run afoul of their theological lens, 
they start to get very upset and they start to challenge you. And I, I, those people would traditionally just kind of exhaust me. And I would wonder, why is it that you can't allow for any other view of God than what you've always, always had? But just last night, I had a bit of a breakthrough, and it's relevant to what we're talking about in worldview and how we can maybe jump from different uh, perspectives. But it just occurred to me when I was listening to this guy that this man has been hurt by the church. He has had things in his life where people have um, led him astray, given him bad advice, and he has suffered real consequences. And so as a human being, there is woundedness there that I'm running afoul of, that if I say the wrong thing, then even if, even if, let's pretend I'm 100% accurate somehow about the, the truth of God, he can't necessarily hear it because of where he's coming from because he's so wounded. And instead of engaging with him in some kind of a debate, instead of doing a, some kind of theological proof texting with him, um, I wanted to just kind of let him tell his story. And what often happens is in the relating of the story and in the, the venting of the grief and the hurt, then there comes back around a point where we can listen to each other. And then uh, you emphasize where you both have things in common. And often you're on the same page deep down anyway. And so I think that that speaks a bit to our conversation here is that with science and um, faith, often we are not quite so disparate as it may appear, but we're coming at it in a sense that is so emotionally charged because we have somehow been wounded. You know, I, I had a teacher who was an atheist and he drove me crazy, or I had a pastor who was sure that the earth was built in six literal days, you know, and somehow you've got this kind of a, a you know, this anger because of your experiences that won't let you get outside of your box. And if we're going to be Christians who interact in the real world, I think that we would do well to be aware of that kind of woundedness and that background because it so describes some of what Torrance is saying here in terms of people's ability to get out of whatever particular box they're in. So I hope that makes some kind of sense. Well, it makes a ton of sense. That's another word, the word that came to my mind for hurt is just the fear that people have of if they give up their the certainty they have that they're going to lose control and be hurt again. I mean, your hurt word comes in. So let's say most people who are controlling or fundamentalist or whatever, it's just a function of the fear that has arisen in the past, as you say, because of something that didn't go well. And they're not going to, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, right. shame on me. They're holding on to certainty in what it is they feel like is going to protect them from yeah. that hurt again so that's a wise a wise word i think thomas kuhn uh, uh, describes within science where it says uh, 10 people approach the same problem and fail they cannot get it uh, and the one person get, jumps to the new paradigm and succeeds uh and he asked the question says why did these nine fail as many of them, it was they were terrified. Uh, they could not give up the box, the mm. security of the box. Uh, we're talking this way. Uh, which is say the phenomenon that you're discussing is not just a religious phenomenon. It's a general human phenomenon that we yes. stick with the fam familiar until essentially, as, as Tom might say, reality forces you to, mm. eat, to, to sh shift paradigms and try to reorganize it. Because yeah. otherwise... Science stops. Uh, the, the one in particular he was looking at was the, the divisor of the periodic table. Mm -hmm. it, it took him years to do it. And over and over again, people kept telling him, give it up. It, mm -hmm. It's not there. It's irrational. It, it, you're wasting your time until he got it. And then suddenly everything shifts. And within 20 years, it's, the, there's periodic tables on the walls of every chemistry class in, the, in America. That's the kind of breakthrough moment that that's, it makes people hope and uh, keep confidence that mm -hmm. if they stick with a certain kind of objectivity, they'll get there eventually. But it, uh, Kuhn makes the comment that, that, that the history of science is not marked by cowards. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm going to go to you first, and then Dwayne will go to you after that. Uh, very quickly, just... Steve, your word fear, 
and woundedness. You started with the COVID experience, which is a good place to start. It's 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 still raw and fresh, and we're trying to reassess it. I think we had an election in 2020. A number of uh, governments had uh, you know, transitional possibilities at the time, and and just about every election stuck with the uh, going government in one form or another for fear, for fear of uncertainty, for wanting continuity, for just and and then the word fear around 2020 right through to 2023 for me at least is dominant because you know it, it's a it's a powerful thing so thank you for for bringing up a covid and b for bringing up the word fear in relation to where that you're, you're sort of you know are discussing stuff now thank you and that's in no, new zealand you. just to be clear about where where that election was mm -hmm. Oh well, it wasn't only no, it, it it wasn't only New Zealand, but 2020 was New Zealand. But there yes. were other elections around the world, and 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 very few changed governments. Right. Okay. Very few. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Dwayne. Yeah, I just wanted to point out in that direction because it's the same thing with science or theology. People trade their uh, their freedom for uh, the known and that fear based thing where they don't understand. Grace allows the possibility of exploration, you know, and, and and because there's there's remedy for even if you make mistake or sin or, you know, rebellious, whatever like that, like, because I was thinking of Thomas Kuhn and the paradigm shift. And that's, that's where most people don't realize. And that's what, like, you look at the reaction, people are still reacting to Bart and Tom and others in that whole, whole understanding because, but the, the fact that we have the mediation that provides true knowledge like all, that grounds you, you can, you don't have to go anywhere. The people will come to you. They eventually have to come to that reality, whether they want to or not. That is yeah. the security. That's the reality. That's the truth. Yeah, very good. And last week, I think it was a little example of that with Andrew McGowan, with um, certain British evangelicals who are afraid of giving up scripture being the revelation of God. Um, they, they say Jesus is the revelation and the Bible witnesses to it is that fear that we're losing something that's authoritative and all that. So I think that's a good example of what you're, of what you're pointing out there. Well, you have to wonder, is, is that because like, like with, uh, with uh, Steve talking about, because part of the problem is like, he's talking about the stoical understanding of deity and this rationalistic interpretation. And, and all it is is abstractions. How do you have a relationship with an abstraction? And, and that, until you know the difference, <laughs> the, the extraction never lets you down, you know, in, in a certain way. <laughs> but when you're dealing with when you're dealing with real people, they can really hurt you. Yeah. You think an abstraction hurts? Idolatry? You know, real people and loving them and forgiving them, that can really hurt because yeah. you let them get close. Yeah. Which, and a lot of people in the United States have stories of either themselves or their parents or somebody either being wounded or being the wounders. And to the point that people just they want nothing to do with the church anymore because they feel that it's it is the oppressive wounder in a sense, Steve, to use your term. And so I think that what you're pointing out is just so important for just asking the question about what is the nature of the gospel as it speaks into mm -hmm. the fearful context that Brighton talks about mm -hmm. um, 2020. It's, it didn't just come into being in 2020, but it mm -hmm. it just made more manifest, maybe. But I think your your point uh, just raised the question of you know science as allowing the gospel to speak to the wounded people of the world, and that mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's not just you know say the sinner's prayer and you know you're gonna go to heaven and all is well. It's like no, when the truth encounters you and grasps you, there is something that allows you to see all of the false beliefs about you know the conditionality and the need for a certainty that wounds other people, that all those things are not the gospel. And it really calls into question, how do we speak and live the gospel so that it has a continuity with the best of the science of God, theological science, again, um, so that the gospel does what it wants to do, and that is to make people whole and not to live in their fear and woundedness. And I think in, in the midst of this discussion is the the metanoia concept and the the how how willing are we to change direction and to say, I'm, 
I'm repenting of what I used to think or believe and, and coming back around to what I now understand to be truth or let's say at least more accurate than what I used to understand. And, you know, I'm guilty as anybody for uh, I in my earlier years of preaching, I would basically regurgitate what I had heard other pastors and preachers say, including, you know, throwing science under the bus. You know, the scientists will never understand the truth that we know as the people of God and, you know, just making those same kind of mistakes. But I've had to be educated and repent of that kind of a, a, a a dualism, let's say, you know, to to come back around and say, look, they they need not be in in this dialectic, but rather it can be something that you know we we appreciate both of, and which is really at the heart of this um, this discussion. Um, I'm, I kind of want to make sure that we touch upon um, his discussion of dogmatics because yeah. I think it's so important here, and I know that most of us are probably familiar with it, but I love how he he really bears out the truth that um, it does not, well, to quote the um, the vernacular, I hope you don't mind, but uh, the princess right. bride, that word, I don't think it means what you think it means. And uh, in this case, when we have dogmatics, it's not about, you know, this idea of, you know, something just being a, a harsh system of beliefs that, you know, is not flexible in any way. Um, Dwayne, did you want to say something briefly before we jumped into that yes hang on yeah yeah john mckenna used to always talk about that he always felt that that dogma isn't the same thing as dogmatics mm -hmm. and that's that's where a lot of people have this misunderstanding because they think catholic church and structure and stuff like that and and uh because we make the mistake that our idea is absolute mm -hmm. you know there, none of our ideas are absolute because we don't know everything it's yeah. a theory until and that's where contingency comes in. And that's where that's the fundamental problem that everybody has is that we can be wrong and still actually survive in certain areas of our life and thrive even, even though we don't know everything, you know, right. and that's where when people make these paradigm shifts or, or they get confronted where the world is bigger than they thought. And, and, and there's more to know than they thought that, 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 that being made smaller makes it really difficult. But if, realize that the world was made for us like we talked about last week or last time about the anthropic principle where the whole creation is set up so that we can thrive and we can know it through the way we relate to it like once you turn it around and not see that the world as violent and threatening but as possibility and a place for fellowship and friendship yeah. you know and, and open learning where grace covers your mistakes it's a whole different reality that that till people understand that and understand what really what grace means you know they they're there's still a fear and trepidation uh, trepidation you know they don't want to be told that this is an absolute understanding of reality right right yeah well i just want to read through these paragraphs briefly because especially for anyone uh, listening who hasn't read through or isn't familiar with the concept or maybe someone who's going to watch the recording later um, he says it was in the course of this development that proper theology arose, and by proper theology, I mean dogmatics. Let me explain this. In the ancient world, the schools of Plato and Aristotle were succeeded by the new, so called New Academy, in which philosophers, who sang, soon came to be called skeptics, concentrated on asking questions and questions and questions, but were not prepared to entertain positive or, I'd argue, you know, answers in, in the sense of um, specific answers. Um, the kind of questions that people so often ask in the ecumenical movement, that is to say, questions that do not yield the kind of answers that commit you to a decision and change. And this goes back, I think, to what Marty was talking about. And it reminds me of C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce with the character who is purely theoretical. He loves the concept of God. And when he is invited to meet Christ, he's the, the, he counters with something like, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? And, and he just kind Kind of laughs at the idea that it would be great if you one could actually meet the living God in person face to face. You know, that that would be great, but I'm sorry I have to move along to a lecture right now. And it was this beautiful portrayal of the belief in a, a system or an idea rather than the reality. And I see that here as well, that rather than saying, look, let's actually come to something that has an answer, it's almost like we have this intellectual playground and we don't want to leave the playground ground and actually do something productive in a way so uh, i think that this is really important um, Lewis is that hideous strength maybe that hideous strength is the same 
mm. thing that stands against the truth and therefore it's yeah. hideous but uh right. so anyway yeah yeah um let's see um and of course we we still dub questions that uh of the sort merely academic questions but in the last two centuries before christ and in the first two centuries after christ there arose philosophers of a different kind initiating a movement of of thought that in some respects was the precursor of empirical science who were nicknamed by the superior people who ask only academic questions the dogmatics because they devoted themselves to questions yielding positive answers and thus to inquiries leading to real and useful knowledge. Now, I kind of feel like this almost um, brings up the topic of what we would call practical theology. And in, in my sense, in, in in my bias, in my worldview, uh, to me, practical theology should be uh, a redundancy. Uh, to me, anything that is not practical does not really belong in the realm of theology. Um, if it if it doesn't relate back to our everyday lives, then it it kind of doesn't relate to the God who is imminent and um, and Emmanuel who's with us. Uh, but that's my particular lens. Oh, I agree. Um, uh, let's see. Um, these uh, dogmatics claimed that they were concerned not with abstract and useless questions, but with questions about the actual world around them and with the kind of answers forced upon them by the nature of things which they could not refrain from accepting and acting upon. Thus, the dogmatic person turns out to be not a philosopher, but a scientist who thinks only as he is compelled to think by the objective and intrinsic structures of nature. So I won't read all of this, but um, he talks about how there is this inversion um, that really is an unfortunate misunderstanding of dogmatics and that uh, he's talking about um, science and religion in this sense of dogmatics that uh, is relevant and useful rather than just something that is absolute and theoretical. And I think that's really important. And, and as Carrie pointed out to me before too, and it's probably been discussed many times, it is so significant that we have church dogmatics rather than system theology because it's a matter of true beliefs that are relevant to the church and that theology should be practiced on its knees and in that sense it's not a matter of abstract ideas in a system which we should then use as a framework in the abstraction but rather they are relevant things that inform us about the very god that we claim to be in relationship with and to me that that's that's fundamental to understanding trinitarian theology and why I have my books that I'm writing structured the way I do, with mm -hmm. insights for pastors in the church and all that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. I'm reminded that it, it, at Edinburgh, they used to be rather proud that in the 1700s, uh, Oxford and Cambridge were still very much in, this, in the laps of uh, Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy. And you got your degree by being able to argue with Aristotle and Plato. You did not get a degree from being an engineer or a mathematician or a doctor or a lawyer. You're supposed to have this, you're supposed to have your university education in the ancients, and then you go to a grad school to get, get the practical skills. And mm -hmm. in, in Edinburgh, they said, no, we'll just they chuck the classical education and said, come on, we will start with mathematics and physics and chemistry and geology and then for at one point, Voltaire said, "All of Europe now goes to Edinburgh for its philosophy." Uh, the the this the discovery of the practical use of good constructive questioning advanced the science and advanced the engineering and advanced the the civilization of of, uh, of, of Scotland uh, and eventually much of Great Britain. Uh, that. Just a, there's a, a reminder that the kinds of questions you ask can yield good results or meh, and meh will always sell. Uh, mm. Watch cable news sometime. Mm. <laughs> yes. So yeah, the nature of what we call orthodoxy is ortho right. Doxy we say is teaching, but it's really glory. I mean, right glory. And the ortho, who gets to define the ortho part of that? The human. And I think it's really standing against, in a sense, what it is that 
Torrance is standing against here. It's the human being the judge of what is right and thinking that that is the final word. But as thinking, what if we, it's, and, oh, people then go on to say, well, we need orthopraxy and we need orthopathy, a right feeling and right practice. But if we, if we go with theodoxy, then we're in line with Bart that it's all allowing the glory of God to speak to us, which isn't just light and bright. It's the revelation of the God, the person of Jesus Christ, so that the glory of God, we, um, John 114, the glory of the Father, we see it and we hear it as the word becomes flesh and we are addressed. That is the science of the church really letting God be the one who speaks, which I often say at the beginning of a theology class. Now, most people say theology is our talk about God. What would happen if we let God talk to us and then we try and reflect on what he's saying and how it speaks to us? Mm. It's 180 degrees and not intuitive, but it really is. The, that's Bart's Dewis Dixit. God speaks. That is the starting point. And I think Torrance really lives in continuity with that. And so to see this chapter in the light of that and what it is that you're saying, that all these things that we say about God have a propensity to get in the way when we really do the work of listening and then reflecting out of that listening and clarifying, then we're then we are doing dogmatics, the the discovery of what God has said and how we live in the light of it, then practice and God, it all comes together in the way that uh that you are pointing towards. Mm -hmm. the, the um the, the phrase that bounced out at me at first was when when he was saying that, that it really uh, when the, theology was only dealing with with god man relations uh it overlooked you have you, even to go even in the basics of theology you have to do god man world relations and sometimes god world man relations that that no theology can stand simply in an isolated solipsistic self mm -hmm. so you've got to have a, a a attitude towards creation that that uh, factors into your attitude towards humanity and your attitude towards God. They're all tied together, and if one of them is off, mm. the whole the whole enterprise is going to be pulled down. And it, his he is pleading with theologians to please pay attention to what science is doing and saying. They need your help, and you need theirs. So a, a little humility and charity would go a long way here. Uh, and I, I found that true. Yeah. Yeah, Ken, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that's really the heart of this chapter right there. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And why why he's hitting really hard at the nature of creation uh, and speaks about creation out of nothing and contingent freedom and those concepts that go along with it. I mean, yeah. that that's what makes what you just said so crucial to theology, which he sees as far behind the curve in general. <laughs> yeah. I, like I, theology, I, I, theology kick started science and went away. Yeah. Science, science kept going and theology hadn't caught up. I mean, that's, you know, to me in a nutshell is kind of the point he's making. And a mm -hmm. big part of that is theological misunderstanding of creation and the God yeah. who is creator. Yeah, yeah. and, and a, a yeah. good, there's any number of really good uh, cumulative histories of science in the Western world now that will show you that it was yeah. not a straight line up. It was uh, up no. and then crash and then up and then sure. crash, up yeah. and then crash. Kind of like human history. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing about science that it pre preserves it from nature, or that is say from evil, I should say. That, that no. evil no infects and corrupts everything uh yeah. that's when sometimes a theologian might be a good friend to have while you're looking in your microscope it sometimes yeah. helps for sure we, we we need each other and scientism and science are two different things no radically different no but it, bart had an essay you know the two essays in his uh uh uh, Protestant theology in the 19th century, the, the full length version. He puts two essays on, on theology in the 18th century and theology in the, uh, and what humanity was struggling with in the age of, of uh, the Enlightenment uh, and, and the, the, the modern science. And one of the things he makes, he, he jumped off the page for me as he was saying, 
so many scientists, and he was looking at Galileo and Newton and others, could not do their science with if they did not have faith. Right. right. That when they put in the work, they would get the results and it would be blessed. Uh, Newton, I, I got a biography of Newton called In the Presence of His Creator. It was a the religious vocation. And they had no problem of being religious and scientific. Uh, that it, it is that faith that, that Tom is looking at, that confidence that if if the, if you attend to the world with devotion, the world will respond by revealing its design. Uh, and the scientists who are not religious believe that, and religious people who are not scientists believe that, and that's something they have in common. And it is not common to all people practicing science around the world today. Uh, there was one time a book called The Tao of Physics, which tried to yep. propose another way of relating philosophy and science. Uh, and and uh, the uh, Alfred uh, North Whitehead and his, his process theology tried to relate science and religion, uh, both in ways that uh, have proved not just not to be satisfactory. Uh, but it, it people are constantly proposing other ways of trying to relate God, humanity, and the world. Uh, but you can't work without them. Of course, TF will point to James Clerk Maxwell as being moved by his religious, religious intuitions to discover, discover field theory, yeah. which is so important for Einstein and everything that follows. The Man Who Changed the World is the book that I just got a few weeks ago. Clerk Maxwell, because of intuitions in faith, he was able to see things in science. Just adding to what you're saying, Ken. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Tom was very pain to say, I am not saying you have to be a Christian to be a good scientist. Yep. Uh, I am not saying that only Christians can do science. This is a human occupation and, and part of our, our co-humanity joins us all in it. But those who are also doing uh, dogmatic science sometimes have some good suggestions to make and can help the, the whole enterprise over these little these hurdles by by contributing ideas like contingency just to get back to this chapter right. uh, like that there is a unity in the whole of creation and if you trust it it will reveal itself to you and contingency is not a bad thing it's a good thing it's uh, and the the last one was uh there was a third freedom contingent freedom freedom Freedom, yes. That the, the more freedom, right, right, the more right. we understand, it is not the case that we become more determined and confined. The more we understand, the more uh, spontaneous and free we are. How about that? As a matter of fact, I was hoping that we would um, make some time to discuss that very topic, this idea of contingent freedom, um, because again, on the surface, the, the language of it almost sounds paradoxical. Um, let me just pull up a paragraph here on the screen so we can read it together. Um, let's see, he says, the contingent freedom of the universe then is not something bound up with randomness or chance, for it is no more arbitrary than the freedom of the God of infinite love and truth upon which it rests and by which it is maintained. It is a freedom that derives from the unlimited freedom of God, but it is a contingent freedom that is therefore a limited freedom. An unlimited contingent freedom would be an inherent contradiction that would spell arbitrariness. Limited though contingent freedom is, it is limited by the very freedom of God on which it is grounded. It is nonetheless a genuine freedom, the kind of freedom proper to a finite and contingent universe. On the other hand, because it is contingent upon the unlimited freedom of God, unlimited freedom of God, it is a freedom that embraces inexhaustible possibilities. That is why, as we explore the universe and our scientific activities, it keeps on surprising us, disclosing to us patterns and structures in an indefinite range of intelligibility which we could never anticipate on our own such is the excitement of scientific enterprise indeed it is the hallmark of a true scientific theory in its bearing upon reality 
that it indicates far more than it can express, so that the more we probe through it into the intelligibilities of the universe, the more exciting are the aspects and forms of reality that become disclosed to us. The universe constantly takes us by surprise in this way because it is correlated to the infinite, inexhaustible freedom and rationality of God, its creator. It's understandable, therefore, that Christian theology should think of the creation as grounded upon the grace of God, for grace is the free love of God, which always takes us by surprise. And it is also understandable that natural scientists like, Mike, like Michael Polanyi should suggest that reality may well be defined in terms of its power for manifesting itself in unthought of and unanticipated ways in the future. It is certainly in respect of its contingent freedom as well as its contingent intelligibility that the universe disclosed to us by modern scientific inquiry stands out more and more as an open universe that we may grasp and describe only through open structures of thought. So many, many words to describe what I think is one core idea that we've touched upon already, but I think this idea of contingent freedom is one that deserves a little bit of discussion before we finish up today. Um, Dwayne had a hand up. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is one area John McKenna really hammered me on. It took me a long time to understand. Yeah. When you're listening to what, what he's talking about there, Tom, is that this is what we were talking about last week where uh, Andrew McGowan couldn't understand. He thought Tom was, you know, creating things out of his own imagination where there's an intuitive knowledge the way the way just when you're looking at nature to disclose itself by you looking at it and not looking through, but you're actually really looking at it. And it's similar with theology where there, there's an, there's an awareness that becomes in your consciousness from outside yourself because the truth comes from outside yourself to confront you. And it takes you a while to articulate and enunciate what it is that your experience is, you know, and, and once you get that language, like, th like th that's why we can have this fellowship in Koinonia together, because when we refer to Trinitarian theology, we all have a rooted and groundedness in, in the language that we're using and the, the understanding of freedom like that, that, because John's last book that he never finished was, it was the God of freedom and the freedom of God. And he, he, you know, and he had me thinking, and this is where images knowing comes in. You know, we, t we talked about that with Paul Monner. I always thought, because he wrote the last book on freedom that we're going to be discussing. Like that is such an amazing area to inquire in about, not just the radical freedom we have, even though it's limited, but the, what the, the actual otherness, holy otherness of the one who is free. He's truly free. And his motivation is love. Like you just sit there and go, <laughs> how can that be? It's such an amazing thing. And this this is why the world is. It's mm -hmm. it's it's meant to disclose this reality about the one who made us. He is free, but he's a, he freely loves without limit. Amen. Brian, did you want to say something about the quote you put up there? Well, it it's hardly a quote. It's 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 a notion okay. that we have in mathematics, and it's to do with probability. It's to do with chaos theory, even that. Degrees of freedom. I'm not free to sprout wings like Pegasus. <laughs> and that puts it stupidly and bluntly and quickly. Okay. <laughs> I'm not free to see uh, like a, a, a battler eagle. And thank you, Steve, for your business with your documentary about animals that see 200 frames a minute, uh, a second. Uh, you know, it's 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 unbelievable how creatures like like hawks and eagles uh, pick up their prey, and 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 swoop and and you know it's 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 fabulous. My degrees of freedom with vision are a little worse than yours, uh, you know, uh, because I've got very myopic eyesight, and you've all become a blur. Well, you you know, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> but degrees of freedom has to do with the fundamental notion of the world that is constrained i.e contingent and i think if we were to get our heads around that notion of degrees of freedom 
it would help us profoundly with that beautiful paragraph that Steve has highlighted for us. Um, it would help to say, hey, grace is grace because there's a sovereignty about the divine freedom. He just happens to have a few more degrees of freedom than we do. For example, and I'll finish with this, which for me is just unbelievable Barty and stuff. God takes our no and makes it the divine yes. The very fact of our rebellion is turned to our redemption. We crucify the Messiah and the very act of crucifixion is the means of our freedom. Well, hang on. I'm sorry. I don't get this. <laughs> I really don't get this. Well, yes, because your degrees of freedom, Bryden, are trapped in a world of retributive justice or whatever else you want to call the stupid thing. I mean, for me, I focus very quickly on the cross here because, oh, my goodness. I don't get it. Why don't I get it? Because God's degrees of freedom are just a little bigger than mine. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's to do with degrees of freedom, I think. That reminds me of uh, something I read a, a while ago. To it, 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 It's not exactly in alignment, but to me, it, it's, it's almost the same idea that there was an explanation somewhere of how our, uh, our power or our ability to interact with the world around us is limited in the sense that it's almost secondary that um and and again this is pretty reductionist but it's almost as if you know if god wants to move a planet he can think it and it happens if i want to move a book i need to basically think move my arm and then my arm can move the book but i can't think book move and then it happens and so in a sense you know there's kind of that degree of freedom like you're saying that i don't have the freedom or the um the authority or the divine power to just interact with any kind of matter directly. It's not within me. It's not something that I can associate with in a direct way. It's only through a certain set of circumstances. And I just never forgot that because it, to me, that it seems so um, visually um, appealing to think of, you know, well, it, we would call it telekinesis, but what God can do directly interacting with things, I am limited in the fact that I have to use the body that he gave me. I do find it interesting that I, we still don't know, like in speaking of things we don't understand, how is it that I think and then my arm moves? Yeah, I get the, I get the biochemistry, I get the neurology, but I still think that there's some, there almost must be some kind of spiritual quantum leap between whatever the spark is that is me that somehow moves the matter in my, my body. But anyway, that these these degrees of freedom, it reminds me of that. And uh, yeah. well put, Brighton. Yeah. Okay. No, that's what I'm Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the uh, Bart's two one is. I mean, everybody talks about two two on the election, but two one is the the one who loves in freedom, and then the perfections of God are the perfections of His freedom towards the world. And God creates space and time. I mean, the things that he's talking about in this chapter, he creates the hospitable space within which we are free then to move and act and know that we are sustained by the one who accompanies us in that. Um, so that when you get to election, that's God acting out. That's the hand moving when you just talked about the head and the hand. Well, two, one, that's that's God and God's being and willing towards the world and then two, two, the election is him actually doing that in the world as the outworking of it. If you separate two, two from two, one, then you've missed the nature, the nature and character of the God who lives in freedom. And you're going to miss freedom then. And what it means for God to be free for us in the election of Christ who is for us with the yes. And you will miss what that frees us to do in response to that love as well. It is the response of freedom having been loved unconditionally and so all the conditionality we put in that's the unfreedom that's the the fear that we're not doing it right we're not doing enough but you have not been given a spirit of slavery leading to fear again you've been given the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out abba father and so the freedom of 
of God in that, and the freedom for the world, is the freedom for the world and ourselves to be what God made us to be as partners with God, living in the world, caring for the world as the world cares for us as well. There's a mutuality of hospitality that's that's within that. So there the whole question of science, you know, how do we be how do we be good hosts and also be hosted and make sure we're not abusing either one of those or the gift of God in life and the context in which we've been given to stay and all that as well. So yeah. I think this idea of freedom too is is another one of those terms that is so easily misunderstood. And um again, I almost I almost am amazed that any two human beings, even if they speak the same language, can possibly get through a discussion because our <laughs> words can so easily be defined in so many different ways. Um, but for me to say freedom, you know, that's something that Bard or Torrance might take issue with and say, well, it's only freedom if it's something within the purview of what God, you know, makes allowance for. And do I have the freedom, like we were saying, you know, to fly or to do something against his his will? or what he will allow? No. And is that something that should happen in the first place? We tend to think of it in this, you know, solipsistic idea of I should be able to do whatever I want. Well, no, if I'm, you know, in, in the soul of my brokenness, you know, desperately wicked in a sense, then, you know, that's not something that we want human beings to be able to, we don't want a bunch of supermen, you know, going around, but rather we want limited people. And then <laughs> once we are, I love this phrase, I keep revisiting this idea of in Jesus name and how, you know, whatever you ask for in my name, I, I make such an important, yeah, the boys don't, don't get me started on that. Um, but um, th this idea of in Jesus name, I like to define that in as being participating in his will and in his nature and in what he wants rather than, you know, just kind of this, um, this kind of uh, formulaic closure to the letter of a prayer in the sense, you know, that uh, it really means that this is something in accordance with what God would want in the first place. And to me, that that's maybe another way to look at this contingent freedom that I am free to do whatever is within the bounds of what Jesus would have us do or what he has in mind for us as his children. So just another shade of how to look at it. And so contingent freedom is participatory freedom. Is, uh, did I hear you rightly there? That there is at least a continuity, if not a connection between when we say contingent, we're meaning participating in reality as it is in order to experience the freedom. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, what uh, what Ken was talking about with the boys, I believe, is is this idea that there's a a show that I do not recommend that anyone watch, but it is um it is a <laughs> kind of a, a send up of uh, superheroes and what it might be like if humans with their evil nature had superpowers and were not the altruistic people that we tend to see in the Marvel universe. Not and that, born in Smallville. No. Right. Yes. This is oh, in all of their okay. raw human nature and just, yes. So, yeah. Americana. I'm ignorant <laughs> of Americana. Sorry, this, folks. This oh. to know that this is not something you're necessarily missing out on. It's, um, it is, uh, it is raw satire. Uh, okay. Dwayne, you wanted to say something? Yeah, actually, I just want to pick up on what you're saying in Jesus name, like, cause I've been contemplating that too for quite a while. I'm actually doing some work on this because that goes back to the whole divine counsel motif. That's all throughout scripture and the court of law, you know, where the advocate versus the accuser, that's the drama that's written in all the books. And yet the fact is now, because now that we're new creation, we have that same priestly capacity to whatever you ask in my name. And if it's according to my will, and that's what's going on. And we have this mediatorial capacity where with one another and for one another, we can make these requests before the throne and they get heard and then you get responded to. And now, now there's no time or no place where in that name, by that authority, by that power, because now we have human representative. That, that's what the radicalness of him taking our humanity into that area, that space where dominion is not only in the earth now restored, but also in the heavenly realms. And then 
all the pecking order of that creation is meant to serve us through him. And we, you know, it's all, it's already, but not yet. So, you know, when we ask that and, and, and it says there, if two of you agree, <laughs> then ask, <laughs> you know, the idea of unity where, where if the church is unified and we ask, you know, we can expect a heck of a lot more response from that divine counsel. And, and, uh, you know, and, and that's what directs the church. You know, we, we, it sounds like a simple thing, but there's so much beyond the invisible that makes it so. Very good. So I'm wondering, Steve, there, there are three last paragraphs that begin with one of them, today, everything has changed and changed drastically. The next one, what am I saying here? And the last one, what then is the task of Christian theology today? I wonder if you want to pick up on any or all of those, what those paragraphs are wanting to draw to a conclusion, as well as preparing us for the next chapter of the transformation of natural theology. Yeah, I had the last paragraph highlighted. Um, I'll okay. just read it out loud here. It says, it's brief. It says, what then is the task of Christian theology today? It must be the same as that of Christian theology in the early centuries when it undertook this reconstruction of the bases of Greek culture as part of the evangelizing activity of the church with the hope that Christianity would take root in a developing Christian culture. Today, we live in a world being changed by science, which is far more congenial to Christian theology than any period in the history of Western civilization. Here, the task of Christian theology must be the recovery of the doctrines of creation and incarnation in such a way that we think through their interrelations more rigorously than ever before, and on that ground, engage in constant dialogue with the new science, which can only be to the benefit of both. And here I see him tearing down, you know, ultimately this wall, this kind of um let's just call it a, a an a, approaching animosity or at least a, a you know a conflict between the two um really you know it almost strikes me and, and i think we've kind of been developing this idea throughout our discussion here that you no no more need to be a theologian to be a scientist than you do to be a musician or a painter or anything else um they're all completely compatible but they're not necessarily shall we say, contingent upon each other. Um, and, and one of the things that I also see as a bit of a parallel here is that, you know, I spent a while in the business world and then now I've been in the, the church world and I see that both have a lot to learn from each other, but I don't see that either one needs to necessarily um, have a an overriding um impact in terms of deciding how the other goes about what it does. So for instance, there are many business principles that inform what I see as um, the life of the church, especially in an organizational kind of way, that just being what it is as a human institution. Um, there are several principles there that can help and inform our praxis, uh, maybe even our um, what was the um oh my goodness that you mentioned it a, a minute ago marty this idea of the the, the word for glory um doxa. i'm sorry doxa doxa yeah our doxology perhaps doxa. um but it doesn't need to be subsumed by the ideas of business and in the same way there are ideas of uh, faith that can inform and improve the ideas of business, such as servant leadership. You know, these kinds of things um, can be very helpful, um, and they, but they don't necessarily need to be married together. I don't need to necessarily convert the boss of the factory where I might work, and he doesn't, you know, need to make sure that the church where I am runs like a factory, but there are things that both can learn from each other, and, and again, that, that's a simplistic approach, but I see this as a bit at the heart of what Torrance is saying, is that there's so much to be amenable about, there's so many ideas that can be mutually beneficial, rather than throwing up our hands and saying, you are the enemy or you have no idea what reality is and, and i think that that kind of prepares us and lays that groundwork that grammar for continued ideas about what theology means and, and how we approach our understanding of god himself yeah 
know your word servant leadership jumped out at me there to say the nature of what science does and the nature of what theology does is it serves humanity one by virtue of who god is the god who comes and serves the lord who is the servant thank you carl bart and science when it's doing its best it serves us in understanding the world how we live within it how we care for human bodies the ocean the air all of these things there is a servant motif to it that is the god who cares and we participate in that through these different modes and pay attention to different parts that are all dealing with the same subject area but with different perspectives but all with the attitude of service when appropriately done mm -hmm. when the church becomes its own idol and just wants people to hold it up and to you know go to church and they miss the service servant part being transformed into servants um everything gets messed up in the same when science just becomes about how we manipulate the world and give people more toys to play with yeah. It misses the service that might that might be there. So both have a, a prophetic role with one another to call them back to their proper service within the providence, by which I mean the accompanying of the God who is always with us to serve his loving, freeing outcomes to be brought to their fulfillment. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's um, an evangelism that needs to be done uh, that, um, I remember what, the most discouraged and unhappy person I, I encouraged and met in my first parish was somebody who, uh, when I said, what, what can we do about the schools in this city? And she looked at me and she said, nothing. I said, what do you mean? Oh, the corruption, the incompetence, the, the, the political uh, uh, manipulation. It is all futile. There is nothing to be done. Uh, and I, and I, are you convinced of that? I said, I am scientifically convinced of that. There have been study after study after study, and that is just the way things are. See how she had a pro, had lined up almost a physics of of corruption. Uh, that could not be disputed on any ground, and especially not on a religious ground, because everybody knows religion just a bunch of sloppy sentiment by people who just can't bear to think. You go to a Congress, yeah, I think you could probably find that same kind of tiger attitude towards all sorts of social problems. They're just going to have to suffer, because that's all we can do. Uh, over and over and over again, meaning and moral order are being begged for all through sociology, psychology, education. It's it's out there. And we're supposed to know something about that. We really are supposed to know something about that. And the kind of tight integrity of the churches and business and uh, uh, medicine and law in the 19th century is completely collapsed, uh, and they're all on their own and doing what they can to improvise. But it's maybe time to start issuing some invitations. To, can we talk? Let's create some dialogue here. Let's talk. Because I, I, over on this side, I've got a book called uh, Meaning and Moral Order by Bob Wuffno, the sociologist at Princeton. I got a book over there called The Meaning of It All by Stanley Yockey, the, the Roman Catholic uh, physicist and theologian. They are all, and, they, and they are saying the same thing. Amen. Amen. Get a little courage. <laughs> Yes, and I think yeah, just the whole the whole nature of our task in the world, the the I, the fact that the word conscience has science in it, and the con is with, which means there's a knowing with. I think the invitation in this chapter is to know with God the world that God creates, and then to appropriately live the loving agenda of care for one another, to appropriately worship God, and not the world or ourselves. But to have the freedom to be what God has intended us to be with one another in the world and to make sure that God's freedom is extended in the way God extends freedom, which, Steve, all your, your 
cautions on how we use terms and the needing to do them. But if our conscience was shaped not as an individual for what works out for me and to heck with you, but was mm -hmm. really informed by knowing with God what God has made, then this chapter makes sense. It is the shaping of the disciplines of science and theology to be in a knowing, participating relationship with the God who creates and loves and sustains us. Um, we don't these days talk about conscience that much anymore because most people have lost there somewhere along the way mm. and don't know how to talk about it. But if we just say Torrance wants us to be transformed in the metanoia, as you said, of our minds so that we are noia, our knowing is with God. And our conscience is one based out of love and freedom received and hence able to be extended. It puts a beautiful new uh, perspective on the phrase, the Spanish phrase "vaya con Dios," doesn't it? You know, to to go with God, to participate mm -hmm. with God, to to speak with God, and to participate in whatever it is that He would have us do. And like you were saying, Ken, this idea of, uh, I mean, I like the idea of evangelism and witnessing being about sharing what it is that you have witnessed you know a witness is one who is who explains what they have seen rather than what i have been told to tell you or you know what some kind of a prepared speech and then to to evangelize i think is best done in relationship and then you know you have to then get into that ugly mess of being a person with another person in our mutual humanity and then you form a context for those kinds of discussions and nobody wants to do that we just want to you know force somebody else into our own belief system and that's where so much evangelism goes wrong but you're right it that's the kind of hard work that we're called to do and um i don't know to me that that's much more appealing though than the idea of why don't i just do some kind of like a microsoft word export of what i know and then you can download it into your brain that's that's not how it works so yeah, yeah. good well this has been a Be great discussion always ready to defend the hope that is within you yeah defend and offer yes mm. So hopefully what we model in this discussion group is that congenial conversation of learning and coming to learn from the living God and his servant T.F. Torrance and all the other people who have influenced us. And so, Steve, we just want to thank you for taking time today and to bring the wisdom of not only your studies, but also your pastoral ministry and the, the kind okay. of things that you're doing and really bringing this work into its practical application. So we're very grateful for that, as will others who view this in the future. Well, thank you for the discussion. I really appreciate that. Um, that just reading a, a book on its own is not nearly as fun as the what we learn from each other. So thank you all. I totally agree. This is this is I think it's the place Torrance wanted us in conversation mm -hmm. and to recognize we move forward together when we're theological scientists listening to God and one another, and we all all gain by it. So Blessings on you and all of you. Did you want to say something? Well, hey, Marty, I wanted to say I, I found my notes from Tom Torrance's lectures from, 2000, from 1974. And the, the, the second lecture talks about contingency, yeah, unity, and uh, unity, contingency, and freedom. And then the fourth lecture talk, it takes uh, three, three axioms from Albert Einstein, and I peeked ahead, they appear in the next lecture. So uh -huh. uh, he was thinking about the writing of these lectures when he was lecturing us. Uh, we had no idea what we were listening to, yeah. but we took lots of notes, uh, and th there they are. Yeah, but well, we need to get those stand and make them uh, publicly available, maybe. So. <laughs> With my spelling? I don't know. <laughs> That's where humility comes in. <laughs> oh, it'll be humiliating. Yeah. Okay, well, it's also a gift. That's what we look for the gifts. All right. Okay, well, we'll see you all next week when we look through the next book of the 12, number 11 of the 12 of the... It's called The Mirror of Creation by Ambrose, number 12, or no, number 11 in Theology and Science, the French of Knowledge. That's what we have to look forward to next week. So blessings on you, and we'll see you then. Bye. Thank you. Shalom. Shalom.